All right, at this point, you've had lots of experience with using the substitution rule and different techniques for using it for different expressions. What we need to attack now are not just indefinite integrals, but definite integrals. The beauty is there's really not much of a change. Your integration work that you previously learned is still in use here. The only thing is the adjustment that we're going to have to make to these bounds. So this setup is exactly the same. The only difference is what's going on here. And just generally speaking, to let you know what these are saying is that, well, these are values in terms of x. This is x from a to b. If you're going to change the, the variable with which you're differentiating, you need to write these bounds in terms of that variable. You'll see it in these next two examples, how you need to make this change. And it's really not that complicated. It's just something you've got to really keep track of. All right, in the first example, we're evaluating the integral from one to two of one over three minus five x squared in terms of x. Um, in this case, it's probably pretty clear, this wasn't too tricky here, where I'm gonna make my u substitution be three minus five x. The reason I go right to this is I know the derivative of this is just gonna be negative five, meaning there's no extra factors of x that I need to take care of, and there's no extra factors of x up here in the numerator um, to work with in general. So if I differentiate this, with respect to x, what I get is du dx equals negative 5. Um, what I'm going to do now, just in, in one step here, I'm going to multiply over the dx and then divide by this negative 5 right here. You probably can see that from doing these a bunch of times. So now what I get is 1 fifth du equals dx. All right, that's really all of the work of the substitution. What I'm now gonna do is substitute the u in here and then swap out this dx for this negative one-fifth du. Um, though what I need to do is take into account these bounds with this statement right here. Specifically, again, what I need to do is write one and two, those are values of x, I need to write them in, in terms of u. And how I do that is simply this. I'm going to write this integral. Now these bounds, I'm just gonna plug the value of x into this expression for u. I could calculate this separately and then plug them in. But just to show you this, I'll get uh, three minus five times one. And then up here, I'll get three minus five times two. So that's this g of a and g of b, plugging it into this statement right here. And then my other substitutions, let's see, the dx is swapped out for uh, negative one-fifth du, and then the bottom just becomes u squared. All right, now just to clean some things up, let's evaluate these expressions. Three minus five is negative two, three minus 10 is negative seven. I'll pull out this negative one-fifth up there to get one over u squared du. Um, this is an important thing to say at this point too when you've been playing with these a bunch and seen a lot of natural logs output from this. Remember in this case, if I have one over u, I am looking at that natural log or the natural log of the absolute value of u. Um, but this, since this is not one, I can use the anti-power rule. What I'm gonna do is rewrite this real fast as u to the negative two which I then can anti-differentiate using the uh, anti-power rule. So I add one to that to get u to the negative one divided by negative one. I'm evaluating that from negative two, negative seven and negative two. Um, that's all being multiplied here by negative one fifth. Lastly, what I'll do is just do some uh, quick cleanup before I evaluate this. These negatives will cancel each other out. And I'm gonna get one fifth times one over u because this is u to the negative one. And so that will be one over five u evaluated from negative seven to negative two. Plugging those in, what I get is uh, one over negative 35. So negative one thirty-fifth minus when I plug in a two in for here, I get one over negative 10, so minus negative 10 or plus one tenth. Then just to walk through this real quick, these have a common denominator of 70th, so this is minus 2 70ths plus 7 70ths equals 5 70ths, which reduces down to 1 14th. So again, the big trick here is just doing the substitution as always. Nothing changes with that real mechanic that you've been working on. Um, the difference is that when you substitute to u, you need to make sure you translate these bounding values into u, meaning just plug their x values here for the lower bound 
and then for the upper bound. You don't need to write them like here. I'm, I'm going to do that just to, just to really model that, but you could do that calculation on the side. Find out this outputs a negative two, plug the negative two in, find out this outputs negative seven and put it there. That works just fine too. But making sure you make that adjustment after you do the other magic. And then in when you evaluate, it's the same as always. Um, nothing really special to do there. Here we're just adding a couple fractions, doing some canceling and getting down to 1 14th. Let's now see our other example. It'll be fairly similar, but you see how we make this adjustment to these bounds. All right, in this second example, we have a little bit more going on, but it isn't too difficult to see what we're going to do for the substitution. In this case, um, what I have is cosine of x times the sine of sine of x. Importantly here is I have this sine of x on the inside. It's weird that it's on the inside of sine, but what I'm going to do is let u equal the sine of x. Um, and really, you probably see it, hopefully, if you've done a bunch of these at this point. Another consequence, not just because it's the inner function, it's also because the derivative of sine of x is a factor right here. Let me do this swap with my differentials. And so quickly here, I get the derivative with respect to x of sine of x equals the cosine of x, which equals, when I multiply that dx over, I get du equals the cosine of x dx. Now doing this swap and making sure I take care of these bounds of this integral first. So here we go. And this is now going to be sine of zero. So I'm just plugging again zero in to this substitution for u and then pi over two. So this becomes the sine of pi over two. Uh, and then my swaps become this. I can uh, swap out the cosine of x and dx factors for du. And so I get du from that. And then this becomes the sine of u. And so I get sine of u du. And then calculating these bounds, uh, sine of pi over 2 is simply 1. Sine of 0 is 0. Uh, so this all stays the same. We're now ready to anti-differentiate and evaluate. So this becomes the antiderivative of this is negative cosine of x. I'm evaluating from 1 to 0, plugging those in real quick, negative cosine of 1 minus negative, I should just put a positive there, let's fix that real fast, plus the cosine of 0. The cosine of 0 is 1, so what I'll get here is negative cosine of 1 plus 1, and I could evaluate this, but this would be the exact solution to this definite integral. Again, the important thing to show in this video is simply this adjustment right here, that when you make this change to du, just like you would in any kind of indefinite substitution rule problem that you're working on, you just have to make sure, and this would trick you probably a few times when you're deep into like a problem. Let's say we're doing something like a um, we're doing these slices and volumes of the spheres and things like that later on. You, you'd be looking at that and you want to make a U substitution to tackle it. Sometimes you'll forget to make this final substitution. But the important thing again is just do all your work, but make sure you make these changes. Everything else, all the evaluation is the same.